request my colleague Niladri Modak to uh, kindly formally introduce Professor Lundin and we can go ahead with the presentation. Niladri, please. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Jivan. So it is our great pleasure uh, having Professor Jeff Lundin from University of Ottawa to give a lecture on the occasion of upcoming uh, festival of light Diwali in our India. Uh, so yeah, so to formally introduce him, uh, so Dr. Uh, Professor Jeff Lundin is a Canada Research Chair in Quantum Photonics and a professor in the Physics Department of the University of Ottawa. Uh, so prior to July, July 2013, he, he was a permanent researcher at the National Research Council of Canada. He did his undergraduate degree at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. After that, he returned to Toronto to work with Dr. Ephraim Steinberg at the University of Toronto, where he earned his master's and PhD also in uh, experimental quantum optics and quantum information. So as a postdoctoral fellow, he then did experimental research in University of Oxford and ICFO Barcelona. So at Ottawa, Dr. Jeff Lundin's uh, experimental and theoretical research uses photons to test and apply ideas from quantum physics. In a broad sense, Dr. Lundin's research focuses on developing methods to generate, manipulate, and characterize single photons and entangle photon pairs, then to use these quantum states of light to build novel quantum logic, communications, and metrology devices. So thank you, uh, Professor Lundin, uh, to be with us. Uh, now the stage is, virtual stage is yours. Thank you very much, Niladri. And thank you for the invitation. I'm just going to start sharing. Okay, can people see that? Yes. Yep. Okay. So, <clears throat> right. So today I'm going to tell you about uh, this invention called the space plate. And it's a plate that replaces space. And we can, I'm going to tell you how it can be used to compress imaging systems. Uh, so not, not all of that's going to be very clear at the moment. Um, so I'm going to introduce the concept first. And just to pique your interest, this was... Uh, collected in one of the top 25 physics articles in Nature Communications uh, this past year. So just to tell you a little bit of, about where I'm from, so I, I'm at the University of Ottawa. Ottawa is the capital of Canada. Uh, the university is alongside, is right downtown in Ottawa, and it's alongside uh, this canal. And usually the canal's um, liquid, but in the winter it freezes. It's about eight kilometers long, and it turns into a big skating rink, and so people can can even skate to work. Many people skate to work. This is one of my labs in the University of Ottawa. It's at the ground floor of this really beautiful building that was built for photonics um, and it has lots of great features for photonics too. I have another new lab uh, down the road <clears throat> at the National Research Council where I used to work. So I'm back at the National Research Council. It's called the Transpectrum Quantum Technologies uh, Lab. And it's in conjunction with Ibrahim Karimi and Ben Sussman. National Research Council is the sort of national labs of the of Canada. Um, so this is a picture right from right beside the lab. So the lab is that is where the the building is for the labs. It was sort of the first national science building in Canada. And there's these beautiful waterfalls right beside it and restaurant. And then just across the river. There's uh, Gatineau Park, um, a beautiful park with lakes in it, and you can go camping and, and do stuff like that, kayaking and canoeing. If you're interested in uh, coming to the University of Ottawa, uh, in particular, we like to take PhD students because we have uh, funding for international PhD students. So if you've already finished a master's, um, please feel, uh, please do apply. So a little bit about myself, because this talk is sort of a new area for me. Uh, uh, my background is mostly in quantum optics, so the quantum physics of light. Um, so my lab was the first to directly measure uh, the wave function, which was um, voted one of the top 10 breakthroughs of 2011 by Physics World. Um, we did one of the first uh, quantum enhanced sensitivity um, measurements, that's called quantum metrology. And we do a lot of measurements with photons, uh, studying them, studying their detection. We did the first quantum tomography of a detector 
of any kind. Um, and we are the first to produce photons in a pure spectral state. So this talk in particular involves these people. Uh, so many students over the years have been involved with this, uh, this project. Uh, it didn't start that long ago, but <clears throat> students tend to be interested in it. And so they, they, there's lots of people working on it. Right now, I have the people down below working on it. Ryan, Ryan Hogan, Michael Weil, Nicholas Sorensen, Irina Mamcher. But most of the stuff in this talk was done by these people up here, Jordan Paget, Ali, Michael DeMastro, Kat Barron, and my postdocs, Lambert Ginet. And in particular, it was a collaboration with Robert Boyd and Ored Reshev. Um, so Bob Boyd, you might know from nonlinear optics. He's at the University of Ottawa. Um, and then <clears throat> some more recent stuff is in collaboration with Francesco Monticone, some theoretical stuff with uh, Francesco Monticone at Cornell and his student, Cornell Shastri. And also in partnership with some companies, LetterTech and Iridium. Okay, so that's it for the, <laughs> for the background. Uh, so let's get on to the subject of the talk. So um, a Fresnel lens is a collection of small glass uh, segments that reproduce the surface profile of a standard lens. And uh, I remember when I first learned about them, kind of blew my mind that this was possible, that you could just get rid of all the stuff inside and it allows us to make flat lenses. So for instance, or for a while to make thin TVs, they would you still use an old fashioned cathode ray tube but then they would magnify the image with a gigantic flat lens. You can see here with this lady with her arm behind it. And here's a close up. You can see the sur surface grooves on it. Nowadays, they show up in uh, VR goggles because you want you don't want your lens to take up too much room. It would make a, your VR goggle very thick. And incredibly, they show up in contact lenses. They're actually quite common now in contact lenses. So the contact lens is still a lens and then they put on a Fresnel lens on top of the contact lens just to make small corrections to the uh, focal length of the of the contact lens. So these are great, but they do suffer from scattering of light by the edges of the uh, of the surface profile. More recently, uh, people have realized that they can imprint the phase directly, the phase that a lens would imprint on light directly. So if you just look at the optical path length, and the phase that would taken up by would be take given by uh, the length, um, the optical path length going traveling through this glass and just imprint that directly onto light. Well, then you can also make a lens. And a good way to do this is by making little antennas or structures um, using nanolithography. So these are called uh, metal lenses. So you can see you're varying the antenna as you go out radially because it's supposed to do imprint different phases. And uh, so now we can make lenses that are uh, sort of wavelength scale thick. So these are called metal lenses. So these promise to make uh, imaging systems much more compact because you don't need this thick lens. Uh, instead, you can make something that's a wavelength thick. So they promise to make systems that are as thick as this. And you can take all these lenses. So this is, say, a, a telescope or a telephoto lens for your camera. And you can make them uh, and turn them into something as compact as this. But as you see, this isn't all that compact, right? Because even though we've gotten all this, rid of all the space in the lenses, actually most of the space in, in uh, imaging systems uh, is taken up by um, the space between the lenses. It's a sort of forgotten optical element. And so the question that this talk addresses is can we invent a plate that acts like that optical element, the propagation uh, between, of the, between the lenses, the, the way the light that enacts the, the transformation that corresponds to the propagation of light between the lenses, so the propagation of light through free space. So that's the um, outline, that's sort of the introduction to the talk. And then uh, the rest of the talk, I'm going to sort of go deeper into this question, like what would we require for an optical element um, to do that? And we're going to, I'm going to talk about the first experimental demonstrations uh types of space plates and then if we have time some applications and fundamental limits on space plates okay so what does a space plate do well in the ray picture you can picture a ray coming in at a particular angle going through some volume of free space so this would be like the space between the lenses 
And what's going to happen? The, the ray is going to hit that volume at one position, and it's traveling across it, and it's going to leave it at a different transverse position. So there's going to be this walk-off uh, between where the ray entered and where the ray left. So that's what you that's what free space does. And what we want to do is compress that action on the ray into a thin plate. So this region of space is going to, we're going to call D effective. And this thickness of our plate is D, and D is going to hopefully be much smaller than D effective. So this is kind of incredible. The ray is going to come in at one place and then leave at another place. It's going to be displaced by the same amount as up here. And then we can parameterize the compression that this plate allows us to achieve by the ratio of how much space it's replacing compared to how much space it actually takes up, d effective over d. And we're going to call that r throughout this talk. So if you could do this, then you'd be able to make cameras smaller. Because if you put in a space plate, you could get rid of the space between the lens and your image sensor. And you know the distant vision is that you could make cameras that are flat and monolithic and relatively thin by combining the space plate with the metal lens. So you could have a metal lens on top of a space plate on top of your, say, CMOS or CCD sensor. And so you wouldn't need this thick camera. So you wouldn't you'd be able to get rid of you know, um, telephoto lenses like this, this sort of ridiculous one here. You'd be, much, be able to make it much thinner, but also probably more familiar to uh, most of you, the camera bump on the back of your camera. So that, of course, is just taken up um, by lenses and free space, and it makes your phone thick at that position. And so far, people have not solved this problem. So we all have camera bumps on our, on our phones. But <clears throat> it's not just um, sort of obvious imaging systems. There are many other applications that um, work by propagation in space. Like that's one of the sort of ingredients to their their functioning. So one is spectrometers. You come in with some light. Sorry, you come in with some light, and then it diffracts. And you need to wait. You need to let the light propagate for the different colors to separate out, right? So that you can distinguish them. Solar concentrators. So often you want to make solar cells out of a uh, material that has a higher efficiency, but it's <clears throat> sorry but it's much um, more expensive to make or difficult to make. So you wanna concentrate the light on that small solar cell now. And so again, you need that space between your lens and your solar cell to concentrate the light. Um, in integrated optics even uh, uses propagation, not in free space, but in the material in the integrated optical device. So uh, these are called multi-mode interferometers. And so there's some sort of interference effect that is created by the light propagating along and then say you come in in one mode you can leave in both modes so a beam splitter so they use that propagation to enact the transformation they want and then other things that you may be less familiar with called Fourier optics and spatial filters and, and shapers and so on in fact most optical technologies somewhere inside of them rely on free propagation so it would help us to to do that so okay so as mentioned we're going to be doing some polls. These are all anonymous. Um, you're going to be able to uh, just choose your answer. We're going to give you about a minute. And this is not really meant to be like a test or anything. It's just meant to be kind of fun. And I'm already seeing a, a little bit of an issue here in that I can't actually see the interface <laughs> for the for the polling. So I don't know how I get out of that. Let's see here. Oh, oh. Okay, we might have to might have to go. Well, where is the interface? Where have I? Let's see. I see. I, I might have. This is going to be interesting. Maybe somebody else can launch the poll for me. I see. I, I, I can I can launch the first poll. OK, you launch the first poll. Um, and we'll okay. see how that goes. I've never done this before in Google Meet. So sorry if there's some technical difficulties. OK, so we're going to. So this is just to back up that slide. So OK, so this is the first question. So we're going to think about how to replace space. And we're going to think about an interferometer. So hopefully, if you're doing optics, you've played with, played with interferometers or thought about interferometers before. So we're going to take an interferometer. And uh, it's aligned to be at a certain point on an interferometric fringe. So say you're at constructive interference, completely constructive interference at this blue detector here. Um, so 
Uh, now you, we put in a glass plate, just standard glass, index n, n equals 1.5. Um, of thickness d into the upper arm. And the question is, how would the upper path need to change in length in order to maintain the fringe position? In other words, how would it need to change in order to stay the same optical path length? How would we need to move this mirror to move it back to constructive interference? OK, you can launch the poll now. Yes. The first poll. I have already launched. Yeah. OK. Interesting, because I can't see anything. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to give you uh, a minute to, to vote. Uh, so yes. if, if you're with uh, people, so, you, yeah. So, so, so the uh, participants can go to the uh, right bottom corner. You can see that uh, there, is a, uh, there is an icon where a triangle and square and a circle is there. So you can click there and you can find probably a poll option. Uh, so, yeah. So after clicking the poll, you will see the first poll. I think they're supposed to pop up on their on their screen actually when they when you launch the poll. Yes, it, it will also pop up, I guess. Oh, I forgot to give the option. Yeah. There, there's the options too, although it's set in the poll. So I can't see any <laughs> anything about how people so are there voting. Are, there are uh, six votes in okay. option two, and there is one vote in option three. Uh, so now, okay, okay, okay. no, yeah. don't tell people to vote. <laughs> don't tell people what people are voting. Oh, okay, or, okay, else okay. It'll, or else it'll influence the people who haven't voted yet. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's fine. That's fine. Good. I'll give people another, say, fifteen seconds to vote. And then maybe Niladri can can give me the summary. Oh, well, someone raised in. Yeah, it may, it may not work on phones, but potentially. Sometimes that's a, that's the case with polls. Okay, so Niladri, how did people vote? Yeah, so so there is a twelve vote in option two, uh, three votes in option one, and one vote in option three. Okay, so you're all very smart. The correct answer is option two. So you will need to decrease the upper arm length to compensate for the fact that you added this glass. The glass increases the optical path length, and so you need to decrease the, the remaining optical path length by moving the mirror in. So in this case, glass is replacing space in an interferometer, and the effective distance that it's replacing is just 1.5 times t. OK, we're going to go on immediately to our next question. So now we have a collimated beam coming into a lens, and the lens focuses the light. And we're going to add this glass piece. How would the focal plane move? And then, Ladra, you can launch the second pole. Yes. Yes, it is launched. Maybe let me know when about 10 people have voted. Yeah, OK. Yes, 10 votes. OK, so I'm going to give everyone another 15 seconds. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. OK, and the ladder, okay. what was the okay. outcome? Total, total 16 votes. Uh, so uh, yeah, so option one, four votes. Option two, 10 votes. Option three, two votes. OK, so <clears throat> most of you said option two. And uh, I kind of led you into that by thinking about the, the interferometer first. And that's because I wanted you to think about the interferometer first. But it actually does the opposite. So if you put in a glass plate, uh, it actually does the opposite of what we want. It moves the focus away from the lens. And so now uh, the glass is actually 
meaning making the system take up more space. Before we had to move the mirror in, so the upper arm was shorter in total once we added the glass, shorter in terms of physical distance. And now when we add the glass, it gets longer because it moves the focus away. That might be surprising to you. It was certainly surprising to me when I learned about this in grad school. I was like, that doesn't make sense because I understand what happens in an interferometer. But to be honest, it's actually pretty simple because you have your light coming in. It's an air. You have your ray. And what happens when a ray reaches an interface with glass, it bends towards the normal. And then when it leaves, it's going to leave at the same angle it came in. So what happens is it gets moved sort of back uh, upwards. And so it moves the focus further away. So a piece of glass um, does the opposite of what we want to do. It increases the system length. But it, it's even worse than that, actually, because <clears throat> if you've ever used a microscope objective, there's always this little number here at the end that a lot of people don't really know what it is in its description, 0 0.17. Well, that's the thickness in millimeters of the cover slip that goes on top of your sample on top of a, a microscope slide. So it's the very thin piece of glass that goes on top of your sample. And microscope lenses are made to correct for the aberrations that that plate of glass, that cover slip, uh, introduces to your system. So it'll make your image blurry, introduce aberrations if you don't correct for it with the lenses in, in this uh, thing. So a piece of glass is even worse than space because space doesn't add aberrations, but a piece of glass will. So it does the opposite of what we want. It does the opposite of what a space plate does. And that's because we're think in imaging, you're worried about the transverse evolution of phase. Like how does the phase vary transversely? Whereas in interferometry, you're worried about how the phase increases longitudinally along the path of propagation. Okay, so <clears throat> so what if so this brought us to when we were thinking about this, this brought us to an obvious, uh, well not obvious, but uh, a natural conclusion, and that is we need a piece of glass uh, or a material, but with a refractive index that's less than one. And you might be like, oh, that doesn't sound possible, but it is actually. Mm -hmm. So there's there's these materials called epsilon near zero materials uh, that you can make. These some of them are artificial, but also silver. Uh, we'll do it at particular frequencies. And if you put in one of those, then yes, indeed, you get uh, a space plate. So that is one, our first way of making a space plate. You can use a slab of a, a refractive index less than one, so somewhere between zero and one. And how much enhancement do you get? Well, you get one over n. And remember, n is less than one, so it will replace more space than it takes up. But the problem is, is that you still get that refraction at the surface. And so you're still going to actually get aberrations when the, the numerical aperture is large. Um, also, because you're going from now air to a lower index than air, strangely, you can get total internal <laughs> reflection. So that's going to that's going to uh, limit the input range of angles here. So the net, the numerical aperture of the system. But probably the biggest problem is just that although we can make these materials, they are lossy and they tend to be narrow band. So they aren't really usable uh, right now. They might be in the future as optics. And they're sort of still a research program, let me put it that way. But we're going to, later on, I'm going to show you a proof of principle replacement of a, of a medium using a, a lower, in, lower index material, just to show that it works. OK, so let's think about more general solutions. To think about more general solutions, we need to think about <clears throat> What happens when light propagates through space? And to do that, we need to think about its plane wave spectrum, sometimes called the angular spectrum. So this is a plane wave, right? e to the i k r. Here's k, it's wave vector. And you can break it down into the z component along the propagation and x component perpendicular to it. And that wave is traveling at angle theta. A general field, e total, so of any sort of transverse shape, so this is x, that's z, any transverse shape can be written as a sum of plane waves where all you're varying is the real amplitude and the phase. So you can lump those together into a complex amplitude. So you have a sum of plane waves. So any, any distribution can be represented as a sum of plane waves. And the reason why that's nice for thinking about what the space plate does, is because now we only need to think <coughs> about how uh, space affects each of those plane waves. If we can transform each of those plane waves, then by linearity, we will transform the field and if we can transform those plane each of those plane waves the same way that space does, then we'll transform the entire field the same way that propagation through space does. And in fact, any optic can be represented by how it changes the amplitude and phase. 
Okay, so you guys kind of probably kind of understand that. So how how does the phase depend on the angle of the plane wave as it travels through some slab of medium of thickness d effective? Okay, Elijah, you can launch the next poll. We're already already onto our third poll. Yes. Yeah, and again, maybe tell me when 10 people have voted. Yeah, okay, see you. Yes, 10 votes. Okay, I'm going to give you another 15 seconds. Just looking down at my clock here. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, Nalajri, what were okay, the Okay, so total, total 18 votes. Two votes are in option one, and rest of uh -huh. others in option three. Option three, right? Okay. Again, <clears throat> so I'm ask. I, I asked this because uh, it's it's a common one to get wrong, and it's one that I would have probably got wrong too if I already didn't know the answer, <laughs> and I only know the answer because I've thought about this quite a bit. And, and I'll t I'll show you why in in a second. But the phase actually decreases with angle. Now you might think that it increases with angle. It's completely reasonable to think that it increases with angle. Because as you increase the path length through the medium, as you change the angle, you increase the path length through the medium, right? And the amount of phase that you pick up, if we think about a ray, is just the uh, path length through the through the medium, right? Just related to that. Okay, so why isn't it? Uh, why doesn't it, in, it increase? Why does it decrease with angle instead of increasing? Well, <clears throat> uh, plate such as this, right, that we're going to propagate through, this should say de-effective actually, is um, transversely invariant along x, right? It does not change along x. And whenever you have transverse invariance or any kind of invariance, you have a conserved momentum uh, uh, associated with it. So the momentum along this direction is conserved. Momentum for a photon is just p of x equals along that direction, it's just p of x equals h bar k of x. So therefore, the x part of the phase accumulation, right, is actually automatically equal to the to the phase accumulation outside. So basically, if you move from this point to this point, right, inside the medium, it's the same thing as moving from this point to that point outside the medium. And it does not depend on where you are in z. So that part is automatically equal. So that's not you don't get any additional phase due to that to that part. So you only are left with this KZ part that you need to uh, engineer. And if you increase the angle, so Z is just, the difference in Z is just going to be say, this is Z equals zero, and this is Z equals D or D effective. And so Z, <clears throat> we're only looking at the, the phase over here. So Z is uh, constant. And the only thing that can change is KZ. And KZ actually gets smaller with theta not bigger. So people who, who develop thin films, this is one of the first things they learn, and they have to learn it explicitly because it's so uh, counterintuitive. You al always think about rays and path lengths of rays. You can do this all correctly with rays. It just gets very, very complicated because you have to think about like how the ray gets displaced and, and so on. I've done it with rays, and you get the right answer eventually, but you really need a full page of calculations actually to get it. I, I can, we can discuss later. Okay, so the phase that you get is just due to the K, KZ component, and um, and it's just going to be KZ times the distance propagated in Z, so D effective. And KZ, if you just look at this, it's just cos of the angle K times K, the magnitude of K, and magnitude of K is 2 pi over lambda, so that's the, the formula. So 
the main lesson here is not so much that it decreases, that's surprising, but the main lesson is that it, it depends on angle, right? So the phase that you need um, for each wave, you need to impress on each wave is gonna depend on the angle of the wave. Okay, so one possibility we thought about was what if we let the angle, uh, the refractive index in the medium depend on angle, right? I don't even know if this is possible, but what if you, what if you could? Right. So, and then I just said, okay, let's solve for the correct refractive index profiles as a function of angle inside the medium that would give us the correct phase at the output. And it turns out there's many solution curves, right? So for that, so there's many possible um, uh, phases and that's because we don't care about any global phase that you get at the end. You only care about how the phase changes with angle, right? So if there's a, and sort of overall phase offset, you don't really care about it. So these, all of these curves are solutions. This is the refractive index. This is the angle in the in the space plate. And these are all plotted for an enhancement ratio of 10. And what I noticed just from my optics education is that <clears throat> is that, that this red curve corresponds to how a negative uniaxial crystal will change the uh, refractive index uh, will, will ha its refractive index will depend on angle. So a, a negative ref refractive, a negative uniaxial crystal is a birefringent crystal, and that means it has two different refractive indices. There's an optical axis, so it has one refractive index for the electric field that pro that oscillates along the axis, and then a different uh, um, index for the for the electric field that propagates perpendicular to the axis. And when you're at an angle, you get some sort of a combination of the two. And so you get this angular dependence. So I recognize that. And so we realized that in fact, a, a, uni, a negative uniaxial, negative just tells you about which one is bigger of those two refractive indices, uh, is will act like a space plate. At least that's what our theory told us. And the uh, ratio that you get for the enhancement is just gonna be the ratio of the two indices in the space plate. We also found in our solutions, this n equals one, uh, less than one case. So here is this green line, it's less than one and, uh, and it's relatively flat, not completely flat. So the n, if it, was, if it was slightly curved like this, then you would get no aberrations, but because it isn't, you do get some aberrations for an n less than one plate. Okay, so, it, so just to summarize that, a uniaxial crystal, a negative uniaxial crystal replaces space. It only does it for the e-polarized light because the different polarizations see different different indices. Um, and, and it only does it if it's placed in a medium that matches its NE index. So one of the two indices. So it doesn't actually do it for vacuum or, or air. It, it, it only does it if it's only replacing space that's already filled with something. But still, it sort of showed us that this idea might work. So what we wanted to do <clears throat> is actually demonstrate that this concept of a space plate works at all, right, basically. And um, so what we wanted to do is set up an imaging system and put in this uniaxial crystal with its optics axis along the direction you want to compress space and show that it moves the image plane closer to our lens. And also hopefully show that it doesn't introduce any aberrations, just like free space wouldn't add any aberrations. So we took this print and we did this and we took, what we did is we took a camera and then we scanned it, we moved it along. So we moved it uh, out from the lens and we just looked at what image field it saw. And what we, we did it for without the, we did it without the, um the the space plate and we did it with the space plate and what we expect is with the space plate the, the image should form first as we're moving this camera backwards okay so this is going to show that um we used a calcite cube i should have updated this it's actually immersed in glycerol so glycerol matches uh so calcite because it has the largest uh ratio of its refractive indices of any natural material so it's going to give us the biggest space plate effect the biggest enhancement and we use glycerol because it matches the index. Flaxseed it did as well, but it, it, it's colored. So we, it didn't work quite as well in terms of preserving color. Okay, and then we translated the camera through the image focus. Let me see if I can do this, or backwards, back from the image focus, so moving it back. And you can see the one on the right, which is the one with the calcite space plate with glycerol formed the image first, and then the one on the left formed second. I'm gonna show you that again, because it went pretty quickly. So 
The one on the right is what we get when the calcite space plate is in, and the one on the left is with it out. And do it again. See, the one on the right forms first closer to lens than the one. So the, the uniaxial crystal is moving the image plane closer to lens. So it's saving space in our image system. OK. So just to summarize that uh, in a picture, right? Here's without the, the calcite, cal without the calcite crystal, without the, the space plate, and then here's with the space plate. You can see that it's, and then this is the propagation crystal, uh, direction. So this is closer to the lens. We also looked at the resolution. So this is the original image. And then we looked at it um, with and without the space plate. It was blurry just because our image system um, doesn't have a large numerical aperture, but it was equally blurry in both cases. So it didn't look like it was adding any aberrations, the space plate that we had introduced. Then we looked at how it moved just to focus forward. Actually, we did this first, but um, we looked at how it moves the focus forward. So we took it with just the, the, the oil or glycerol. So that's this gray line. So here's the focus there. And then we added this uniaxial plate and we showed that it moved forward by exactly the right amount predicted by, by our theory. So the ratio of the indices. Um, we also did this, because we're doing this in glycerol, a low index or a plate is possible. So we can introduce a plate with a lower index in the glycerol and it'll act, also act like a space plate. And an easy low index plate is just a plate made of air. So we just made two glass slides and a little cavity of air and we showed again that it moves the focus closer to the to the lens by the amount that we expected and then we can look at this walk-off effect as well this this w actually what we directly measured was this delta x um, and so as we changed the angle of the beam actually what we did was we tilted the plate um, we looked at how much the beam walked off compared to what we expected from an ideal space plate and for the correct polarization, the extraordinary polarization, you get exactly the right walk off out to large angles with no aberration at all. Whereas <clears throat> that low index plate, that, that plate made of air, although it follows the space plate curve for a while, just like the glass plate in the imaging system, it starts introducing aberrations and you get this curvature that moves you away from the ideal curve. So it walks off by the incorrect amount. The ray moves by the wrong amount to do perfect imaging. So how exactly is this working? Well, a space plate needs to move, do something weird at its, at its interface, or needs to do something weird with the rays inside it. It needs to make them bend in a way that normal refraction doesn't make it bend. So one way to do that is by having an n less than 1. So it bends in the opposite direction to what you expect. Um, but the other way that we actually exploited in our experiment um, uh, more fully is this uniaxial crystal, this birefringent crystal. And birefringent crystals can do very strange things to rays. So you can have a ray coming in that's normal to the interface. So what you expect is that it would keep going. But in a birefringent crystal, it can suddenly bend and then come out again parallel to how it came in. This is called double refraction. It's kind of a weird name. Um, doesn't really tell you what's going on, but here's an example of it. So this actually is calcite, and you can see you get this double image for the two polarizations. So this only happens for one polarization. So you get one polarization that sees normal refraction, and the other one where you get this anomalous refraction. So the sides of the calcite are parallel. So you should get no displacement of the image at all uh, by normal expectations. So this is the strange effect that that is causing our space plate to work with the uniaxial crystal. Just taking a look at time. OK, <clears throat> so uh, you can look at this in the, in the ray picture and compare it to a lens. So a lens, you have a ray that comes in at a certain angle. And it, depending on where it hits the lens, which is curved, remember, it's going to see a different surface uh, angle. And it's going to bend by a different amount, therefore. So the amount of bending is actually equal to the focal length of the lens times where it hits. This is called ray tracing, or you use this in ray transfer uh, matrices. So the direction changes, but the position is conserved. The, 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 the ray is coming in and exiting at the same angle. How, what do we expect for a space plate? OK, Niladri, you can launch another poll here. OK. Yeah, it is launched. 
Okay, so I'll give you guys a minute to try and figure this out. Yeah, 10 votes. Okay, so I can give you another 15 seconds. Usually when I do this polling, I give people much longer, but because it's a talk, we have to go a little bit more quickly. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so how do people okay. vote? Okay, there are 14 votes. Uh, so uh, two votes are in option one, three votes are in option two and nine uh, for option three. Okay, excellent. The nine votes got it right. The, the, the answer is option three. So as this angle changes, increases, you get more walk off. So this, this change in the position of your ray increases. So the change in position is proportional to theta. And it turns out that the effective is the proportionality constant, at least for small angles. So in a lens, the position changes, but direction is conserved. And the position changes as a function of angle. And uh, a space plate, on the other hand, the direction changes, but the, pos but the uh, position is, uh, sorry, I think I've mixed that up. <laughs> I'll just skip that slide, because it'll be confusing. I forgot to move them over. OK, another way of looking at this is in terms of the phase that they're impressing. And it turns out there's this exact analogy between the phases that a space plate and a lens uh, implements. So in the small angle paraxial approximation, a lens uh, implements uh, uh, this phase. So the phase grows uh, spherically um, around uh, an X. And the phase only depends on the position the light hits. Uh, the phase at a position only depends on the light uh, at that position. So, so we call that a local response. Whereas uh, in a space plate, the phase, remember, is kz d effective. And kz, because k, at least in the monochromatic case, k is fixed, you can represent kz as just k by Pythagorean theorem by this formula. And so you get this formula. And you can see that it's analogous to the formula for the lens um, um, in that you have the spherical profile. And um, moreover, um, because it depends on K, and K is a plane is representing a plane wave, which is delocalized, this is what's called a non-local response. So you can't reduce the response of the system. And non-local responses in media are actually a very hot topic in, in research, because it's very unlike what we do normally in optics, which are these local responses that only depend on uh, the field at a particular position. OK, so. Uh, Probably not going to have time to show you all of the talk, um, so I'll zip through the last part of it. We're going to skip this poll because it wasn't didn't really work well in um, in uh, in um, Google Meet, and I'm running out of time. So there's other things that uh, uh, reducing the image system length helps you with. Uh, one of them is the focal length, right? Obviously, because <clears throat> because the focal length typically is going to be limited to your system length, right? So you can have longer focal lengths and if, if you put a space plate in because you're no longer limited to whatever length you have available to you in your system. Okay, um, the magnification is proportional to the focal length. So the magnification and thus image size is also limited by the length of your system. So if you put a space plate in, you are no longer, your magnification is no longer locked to the length of your system. The resolution is also now not locked to the length of your system. So the resolution is given by your image size. So the resolution being the number of pixels is limited by the image size over your pixel size. 
So that is also now unlocked and you can set it freely as long as you can press space as much as you want. The light sensitivity is just the converse of the uh, of the resolution in that the image size divided by the number of pixels gives you the pixel size. And the larger the pixels, the more light sensitivity you typically have. The only thing that I haven't really seen that's affected by L is the noise. So my conclusion is just that most of the things that we trade off and think about when we design imaging systems and the, and the interplay between them, all those relationships get broken and decoupled if you are not limited by the length of your system. So it doesn't just make systems flatter. It also allows you to imagine completely new abilities and performance and, and uh, shape factors. So for instance, you could think of a camera that wasn't a little thing on the back of your phone, but covered the entire back of your phone, right? It could have the same focal length as the camera you have now or a really long focal length so that the image actually fills up the entire back of your camera. And then your pixels could be quite big, for instance. OK, so I've, I'm running out of time. So I'm going to really not go into this last part of the talk. So far, I've introduced you to the concept of the space plate. And we were not sure at all that this idea would work, even though we had some theory, some predictions. Uh, there's lots of things we were leaving out that I've sort of glossed over. So we weren't sure it would work. So we were quite happy with our proof of principle experiments in the, in the glycerol. But really, we want this to be a useful uh, useful device. And so for that, it has to uh, operate in vacuum or air. So it has to replace space in air. And actually, our, our intention the entire time was to make some sort of microstructured uh, device that directly imprints this, this phase. Um, so the drawback so far has been that it had to work in glycerol. So it's not really something that we don't usually make imaging systems filled with glycerol, although there are some. Um, and then the other problem was that it didn't actually have a very high compression ratio. It didn't replace very much space compared to how much it took up. So the idea is just to design structures that directly target this phase, right? And uh, around the same time that we published this, uh, we invented the space plate and we published uh, the original ideas, put them up on the archive and present them at conferences. Uh, uh, Xiaomi Fan at uh, uh, Stanford also came up with a very similar related concept, although he didn't do any experiments uh, with very different um, system than we were imagining. So here he had a photonic crystal, but again, they designed it to implement this phase and they got a, a massive R uh, of 144. So it takes, it produces 144 times more propagation than the space it takes up. We wanted to focus on multi-layer devices, so thin films, so where you all, you have parallel layers and are just changing the index between the layers. And there you can imagine that you can get an angle dependent phase because the Fresnel coefficients at each layer, if you remember them, are angle dependent, but also the phase accumulated in each layer is angle dependent. So that every layer has those freedoms. And then if you have many layers, you have, and say a few different types of indices, you have many different ways of controlling that phase. From the ray picture, it also looked kind of good because you could imagine this mechanism for rays to move sideways or light to move sideways and create that anomalous walk-off that we wanted that would move the focus closer to our space plate. And indeed, it works. Um, you can make space plates out of multi-layer devices. Um, we introduced uh, a design for one in our very first paper, um, but it was designed using machine learning. So it's kind of a crazy design that we didn't really understand very well. Um, Francesco Monticoni and Cornell introduced a repeatable design. So you can make it arbitrarily thick and he, and you can understand why it works. And it has an R of 5.6. Um, we wanted to show that we could do even better than Xiaomi fans group. So we showed that we could get up to an R of 340. Um, so we have a design that does that. So here is the, this dotted line is the COS theta target phase and then this is the phase that we produce out to our numerical aperture which is a very modest one degree here also notice that um, this is the transmission this this blue curve so the transmission isn't flat which is what we want it to be for for free space so we're also giving up on that a little bit um yeah 
I think I'll just stop with this slide. <clears throat> so when we were doing these machine learning uh, designs, we noticed there's a trade-off between a few uh, different parameters, imaging parameters of our space plates. So one was the there was a trade-off between the amount of compression you could get and the numerical aperture of the system. And uh, we also found that there was a trade-off between the number of layers, the index contrast, uh, and uh, and eventually Francesco Monteconi showed there's a trade-off with the bandwidth. So there seems to be, at least when we try and design these things, trade-offs in their performance. And I will skip this because we're running out of time and just say that with Francesco Monteconi, we studied these trade-offs theoretically. It turns out it's related to causality and how the speed of light in the, in the material. And we showed that for reasonable materials, you could at least theoretically make a device that will work for the full visible spectrum with an NA of 0.3, which is higher than what you typically have in a cell phone camera. Uh, with an R of 8. So an R of 8 would mean that uh, an 8 millimeter space would become 1 millimeter thick, which again is sort of the scale that we're talking about for the back of your, your, your cell phone. I mean, an 8 times improvement in space is actually quite large. So that is promising. So we looked at it theoretically and we showed that we could, in fact, um, probably reach, uh, play with these trade offs in just such a way that we could get this working for practical devices. So uh, right now, though, we've only, I didn't show you the experimental results because they're quite new. We've actually tested these multi-layer devices and they seem to be working. Uh, quite impressive, in fact, especially with an RF 340. Um, but we're still early days. These are only narrow uh, band devices, but metal lenses have gone through a similar journey in that they started off in 2012, so just 10 years ago, as a low efficiency, narrow band, uh, they worked, they didn't even work in the visible, they worked in the infrared, and they were polarization sensitive. And since then, metal lenses have rapidly improved. So now they have an efficiency of 90% and an A of greater than 1.5. Um, they're broadband and uh, achromatic across the visible spectrum. They can be made polarization insensitive and they can be made with a large diameter. That said, people haven't achieved all of those things at the same time. And with our current architectures for meta lenses, it's not clear that we can, although making them slightly thicker might might enable that. Um, there are now commercial companies that sell meta lenses and they're being put into commercial devices like cell phones. So we're kind of hoping that space plates can follow the same rapid improvement. Uh, one nice thing is that these multi-layer space plates rely on a technology that is much simpler to model uh, and much simpler to fabricate because they're, this multi-layer technology is what's on the anti-reflection coatings on basically every consumer device that you buy from your glasses to your phones, to your phone screens, to your computer screens, and so on. So there are lots of companies that do this already, whereas the metal lenses are based on nanofabrication, which is limited to a few facilities in the world. So that brings me to my conclusion. So I introduced the idea of the space plate. It re reproduces the transfer function of free space. Um, I did, showed you an experimental proof of principle demonstration with the uniaxial crystal and glycerol. Uh, but I showed you that there's also all these other potential structures like multi-layer plates. And uh, I didn't really get to go into this, but fundamental limits like causality don't seem to preclude making practical designs. So there are other areas you could think about making space plates for, other places where waves are used, like sound and radar and microwaves. Um, I should have updated this reference because I think this is published now, but you can look at this, for instance, uh, for an example of that. Okay, and that's it. Uh, thank you very much. I guess I'm taking questions okay. now. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this nice and uh, interactive uh, interactive talk. So. Yeah, if there is any question, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask. So I have a question regarding like, uh, you have shown that uh, if we have a refractive index less than one, there basically we can actually implement this concept of space split. So basically that's what we see in actually, if we see that your our refractive index is less than one, there our phase velocity is greater than CS basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
so um, but uh, is this uh, means like the phase velocity is greater than c this also doesn't uh, violate uh, causality in principle because um, uh, because for certain reasons so um, my question is that like uh, uh, is it the same kind of concept that is used like that because we have uh, we can actually go uh, it means like we can achieve subluminal like let's say uh, superluminal uh, wave propagation so uh, by using these properties we can actually implement this phase plate uh yeah it's a good question um it's it's related yes definitely related to i think I haven't thought about it very carefully for the n less than one, but I think you're right. I think it is the action of the n less than one uh, space plate is related to the fact that the phase velocity can be greater than c. Uh, I guess it must be in some sense because you can always link refraction. I think about it in terms of refraction and that just that you get refraction uh, away from the normal when you when you go from a high index to a low index now the high index is air and the low index is the is the material so that's the way i think about it but refraction is always linked back to the phase velocity so and i think that is uh related to the limitations on uh n less than one materials in that you can't make the phase velocity lower than c for a very broad, broad bandwidth because if you did, <laughs> then um, then uh, the group velocity would also be lower than C. Mm -hmm. So there's there's an inherent trade-off between um, how much lower than C it can be, the thickness of the device, and then also the um, the um, the the bandwidth of the device. I don't know if that answered your question. Any other questions? I don't think yeah there would be any questions. So I I, I have a quick question. So so all mm -hmm. this all this experimental demonstration on that that you've shown uh, so it is mm -hmm. for uh, polarized e polarized light right uh, yes that's a good point yes uh, we did it for e polarized light if you send in o polarized light uh, then the material just looks like a glass plate because you don't see this angle dependent refractive index um, so again you would just get this this well it would it would do the what a glass plate would do it, it actually move does the opposite of a space plate and you get aberrations okay. um but for the n let so for the 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 multi-layer devices and for the um the um photonic crystal it works for both polar you can make it work for both polarizations of light and then the n less than one it also works for both polarizations Okay. Okay, I got. So, so if so, I yeah. ask, like, uh, sorry, but, uh, so yeah, like the amazing properties, like what we have, like uh, you said, magnification and all. So they are they uh, usually uh, let's say uh, depends on this, like let's the magnification is f two by f one. Like if we're using a particular amazing um, configuration, so here how this will modify now? Like uh, uh, yes, this slide that you have shown. Now, how can we measure? Let's say, let's let's say I want to uh, increase the magnification to a certain extent or something like that. So okay, so so essentially, the okay, I probably should have emphasized this more because it's a very common question, and that is, like, if you want to make an imaging system shorter, the common question is, why not just put in a lens with a shorter focal length? Right, that would make your imaging mm -hmm. system shorter. It moves your image plane closer to your camera. Um, sorry, closer to your to your object. Um, so it makes the whole thing shorter. Well, the answer is that if you make your focal length shorter, then you make your magnification smaller, right? And so if you just think about it, you have an image sensor that's a certain size. And if your magnification smaller, then the image on the sensor will no longer fill the sensor. <laughs> so you no longer are like, you know, your pixels will be larger compared to a feature in the object so you lose resolution so that's the that's the common misconception is that you could do this just with the lens a space plate does not 
change the angles of the light. So it doesn't act like a lens at all. So it's something that at least to start off with, you could think about just having lenses and then you add a space plate and all it does is it gets rid of the space between the lens and the camera. So it just reduces the, the length of the, of the system. So in, so what does set these in the end, it'll still be the length of the system. So it'll still be like how much space plate effect you can achieve. Right, because the the uh, the effective length of the system will be set will set f, right, um, and uh, so so you, they're still linked together. So instead of l here, you would have l uh, times r or something like that, where r is the enhancement. So if you have a space plate, that's how all those would follow. But because r is set by the space plate, and hopefully you can make that large, now now you don't have to worry about trading trade offs between these as much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, can I ask those one question? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, in space, uh, in the place of uniaxial space plates, can we use a mir uh, mirrors so that we can uh, uh, reflect it and reduce the space, even though the amount of light travels will be the same. But we can, if you place a mirror 45 degrees, then we can reflect and the size of the L will get reduced when compared to image plane and object. Uh, so like almost make a, a little bit of an open cavity. So you just reflect the light back and forth. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. Like, so if you place, yeah. uh, after the lens, if you place a yeah. mirror for five degrees and we can, uh, the same amount of length can be uh, applied in perpendicularly. And then we can uh, again, get back to the sensor. I, I, uh, uh, oh, I see. I see. You divert the light sideways, so you get this the the propagation length, and then bring it back to where the sensor is, or something like that. Exactly. Uh, I mean, you do, yes, you can uh, uh, sort of obviously you can definitely do that, um, and then of course you're taking up more room sideways. So there's always this sort of conservation of <laughs> of space. Yeah, of uh, course. Yes. In, is in there the any sensors. problem in the aberrations will arise in those things, or else? No, as be... long as you're using a flat mirror, there's no aberrations that you get. No, no, that that works. And in fact, like I think there's even one cell phone camera that it's a pretty common strategy in cameras actually to put it in a mirror. And then divert the light sideways to to save uh, this longitudinal distance. Um, so you just put the camera at, at at perpendicular to the to the direction as well, so you don't divert it back. Uh, and I think there's even one uh, cell phone that one type of cell phone that does this as well. But uh, it's pretty common in, in compact cameras, but it's uh, it's hard to arrange in a in a cell phone, obviously. So you can do it. Um, but it's going to, you know, there's limitations to it as well. So again, if you could add a space plate, it would still help that system. It would make yeah. the, the other legs shorter. Yeah, that's a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all the great questions. These are really excellent questions. Um, I have a quick question. Um, can you move to the slide uh, where you actually compare the lens and the face plate? Uh, where I compare the... We mean like where we do it experimentally, or oh, uh, this one, yeah. So the uh, the one next, the next one. The, this one. Yes. So, uh, can we really say uh, if a a space plate does exactly what a lens would do if it were in the Fourier plane? Uh, I mean Fourier space. Uh, so uh, yeah. So your question is if you go. Does a space plate would exactly exactly? Are you asking like if you had two lenses, so you had a uh, you are going to go to the Fourier space in, after the first lens, and you put a space plate there, it would do what a lens would do there. So you're asking, or you're asking the opposite? Yeah, yes, I'm asking something like that. So uh, if you go to the next slide, I think the formula is there. Uh, how phase is modified? Yeah. Well, oh, sorry. Yeah, this one. Yeah, so uh, I mean, I can answer a question that's pretty close to yours. That'll probably answer your your question. So, so the answer is uh, a space plate, uh, a lens in the Fourier space. So, if you can somehow transform x to k, which you can do with the lens, then in that Fourier plane, the focal plane of the first lens, you can put a second lens, and it will act like a space plate as well. 
because the formulas are the same, basically. So in the paraxial yes. approximation, this is in the paraxial approximation, they're going to do the same thing. And in fact, we're, we have, we have done this in the lab now, and we've taken data to 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 show how well it works. At first, when I thought about this, I thought, well, this is kind of silly because you need to go to the Fourier plane, so that's going to take up a lot of space. You, you already have a lens there, and that's going to take up some space to go to the Fourier plane. But then we sort of thought, you know, we should sit down and think about this more carefully and work out the relationships. And in, in the end, it actually does seem like this kind of setup could help you. Uh, essentially, you ha just have three lenses in a row now. You have a, a lens, and you go one focal length later. You have another lens, and then you go another uh, focal length of the first lens again, and you have a third lens. That's your system, essentially. And we've gone through them. I didn't present it in this talk, obviously, but uh, we've gone through the math and we've made experimental measurements on the system. And it does actually seem like it's it is an interesting system, and it does give you some possible, uh, like a pretty impressive replacement of space. The drawback uh, is sort of a very pragmatic one, and that is people have been designing lenses for hundreds of years, right? Designing lens systems even for hundreds of years. And so what I worry about is that somehow that idea <laughs> is already baked into lens designs a little bit. And so that if even if you came up with this, this effective space plate by going to the Fourier space by using three lenses and, and therefore saving space in your total system, that idea is somehow already baked into their lens designs and so that it wouldn't wouldn't help you in the end by, by doing that. But anyway, we're, we're not too sure because to be honest, lens design is a little bit of a black black art. Uh, and uh, so we are studying that in the lab. It's a, amazing that you came up with that right there because it took us a while to, to come to that conclusion. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Lundin. I have a quick question. Yep. Uh, the phase is depending upon the input light angle. But yes. For uh, uh, multiple field imaging, this theta angle of incoming light is very. So this phase is depending upon the field, light, different field angles. Light coming yes. from different field angles. Yes. So for that, this phase is varying according to field, different field angle light. So. Yeah, I mean that's what we're that's exactly what we're trying to achieve. So we want this is the formula right here. We want mm -hmm. the phase of the multi-layer stack to mm -hmm. of the total stack together to impress this phase upon the light. And we basically just I mean the way we did it in my lab is we use machine learning to pick the thicknesses of the layers and the well sometimes the materials, sometimes we fix the mater the two materials. Uh, so it was just the thickness of the layers. We just varied the thickness of the layers until that entire stack gave us this phase. So we're already taking into account the fact that, like, we put into our model the fact that the light is coming can come in at different angles. That's that's what we that's what we model basically. And we use a, a method that some of you might be familiar with called the transfer matrix method, uh, where you just multiply a matrix for each layer and each interface really simple much simpler than 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 modeling a um a metal lens so can we use a telecentric type of system so there is a uh, not depending upon the angle field angle different field angles uh i think a telecentric system a telecentric lens uh it's i've thought about telecentric lenses a bit i don't think they're all that related to a space plate. So a, tele a telecentric lens means that you have no perspective. So effectively, all the rays coming into your image sensor are parallel. So um, it Light almost does it. <laughs> it's of, almost just uh, trying to get rid of angle in your system completely. Whereas, like most imaging systems, are not telecentric, and they and they have a range of angles. Thank you. So, yeah, you're welcome. Is there any more question? If not, uh, so let's thank the speaker once again. Thank you, Professor Lundin. 
uh, for the nice wave. Hopefully, you learn some surprising things from those yes. polls. I put yes, them. I put them all in there because they were all surprising to me when I learned them. <laughs> for instance, no. which way does the glass plate move the focus? It's obvious in retrospect, mm -hmm. but not not obvious from your intuition from the interferometer. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Goodbye. Have a good day. Bye. -bye. Yes. Bye. Bye. Same to you. Okay. Mm -hmm.